thank you so much for taking the time to uh, do this. Oh, no problem. Uh, thank you for taking the time to play the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, I've now uh, I've haven't uploaded them all yet, but uh, I've now actually finished the finished the game. Woohoo! And uh, yeah, it's uh, it was uh, it was super fun. It was cool. It's uh, very much uh, very much capturing the feeling of uh, of I feel like the the Space Quest games, you know, even with the remake. Yeah, well, you know, uh, we, you know, most of the guys that on the team, you know, we all grew up playing, the, you know, the games in the '80s and and uh, into the '90s, and I mean, we, I really connected with the Space Quest series early on when I first started playing Sierra games, and my partner and, and the whole thing there, Sean Mills. Uh, he did too, you know. We we kind of liked the the crazy jokes and and the fun stuff, and uh, you know we tried to be as faithful to it as as we could, while providing the upgrades that um, you know making a game you know go from the original sixteen color AGI keyboard input into a you know <laughs> the, the quote VGA you know because it's a stylized version of VGA point and click version. So you know it, most of the time we just had fun with it. I would say the biggest. Um, the biggest uh, redesign that we had was uh, some of the asteroid sequence in the end, but that's about it. Yeah, I, I hear, I read a little bit about uh, what stuff was changed, and uh, people did talk about that the the asteroid sequence was the most that was changed from the original, and also the most that was improved from the original. <laughs> that you know, and that's so nice. It's so nice to hear because whenever you're Whenever you're playing in somebody else's sandbox like that, and it's a sandbox that you love and that you respect, you know, and but you know that you want to change something or do something a little different when you do it around, you hope that you you know, you still keep the flavor and the feel of it while you're providing a different experience. And a lot of people well, you were were very kind about uh, were, were kind about that. We're like, wow, yeah, the asteroid was definitely different, but we really enjoyed it. So <laughs> it's always nice to hear. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess, I mean, part of the reason why I want to do this, I saw you guys, you know, you, you, you commented on the videos and, and tweeted about it and stuff. And so, uh, and I was super excited to, to know that you're, see that you're still, you know, producing stuff and making all these things. And I wanted to find out, like, I mean, I guess the first question is why, <laughs> why, <laughs> why was this thing made? Like, you know, uh, that there's a there's a good story behind that. It's um for me this uh this whole thing started all the way back in two thousand and two, when um I was uh I was young and uh, I was actually working as a musician. Uh, I was uh, touring and gigging and playing in the studio and uh, and doing that uh, when I was diagnosed with end stage renal disease. Oh jeez! Uh, in an emergency situation, yeah, I was told that my kidneys were dead and uh. I would immediately have to start dialysis and eventually need a kidney transplant. And my whole world collapsed. You know, my life as I knew it ended. And I suddenly was homebound uh, with a lot of free time on my hands. And uh, so I was cruising the internet, you know, feeling kind of down about myself in life. And uh, I found this uh, community of people that loved Sierra games like I did when I was growing up. And I was like, oh, you know. I, uh, I've always wanted to do this, and uh, I discovered the program uh, AGS, Adventure Game Studio, which was a free software that allowed you to make games like Sierra games, and I was like, oh my god, this is great. And so I started spending my free time making those, and I met people from those forums back in the ancient days of the internet before social media. I met uh, I met Sean, uh, my uh, my partner in all this. Uh, he lived in Australia, and uh, I live in upstate New York. And uh, so, you know, we we're completely around the globe from each other. But we became friends, and we decided to start making games together. We were like, you know, we should we should work on this kind of stuff. And we were both fans of the King's Quest remakes that a group named Tierra, which later went by AGDI, had made. And we said, you know, maybe we – I bet we could do King's Quest Three if we really tried because at the time there were so many fan groups starting remakes, announcing them, and then never finishing them. And so we were like, we're going to do it. So we – knowing practically nothing, 
we leapt into making remaking King's Quest three to learn how to make a game. And along the way, we attracted some good artists and musicians and, you know, people that were way, way above a, a, our own skill level. They brought us up. And they elevated us. And for some reason, they took to working with us. And uh, so we made a remake of King's Quest three, which we released in 2006. And towards the end of that, as we were finishing that up, um, Sean came to me and said, hey, um, I've been uh, – I've been remaking Space Quest 2 using the original graphics in my spare time just to practice programming. What if we did uh, for our next project uh, a VGA remake of Space Quest 2? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> and so it started from there. And most of the team that we had acquired from working on King's Quest 3 came along with us to do to do that. And uh, we spent the next several years making that. And uh, that's what uh, you know. That's what kept me going when I was doing dialysis, and uh, I had a first kidney transplant that um, didn't go so well. The procedure, uh, the procedure, they had an error during the surgery, and it, and it really it damaged me pretty good. And I was out of commission for a while. Wow. And working on these games, uh, you know, King's Quest Three and Space Quest Two, you know, really kept me uh, kept me alive. And. Wow. Uh, we're, we were lucky. We built up a fan base over the years, and we got a lot of people that, you know, just love to see us doing it. And we had a lot of encouragement, and so that's that's how we got into it. Uh, are you, you're doing better now, though, eh? For yeah, actually, <laughs> I had I had my second kidney transplant um, uh, five years ago this year, and it was after the second kidney transplant, and everything went really well with that, and I was starting to feel better. And towards the end of that, um, we we hadn't finished Space Quest Two at that point. I said, look. I'm feeling better. We're going to finish Space Quest 2. We're going to release it this year. And then next year, we're going to work on our own original game. We're going to make it. We're going to sell it. And people are going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did. We did. The next year, we um, we started work on our um, our what we called our magnum opus. We started making the game even before we made King's Quest 3, a game called Quest for Infamy. And mm. we um, we raised funds for that on Kickstarter. Because when we started that, it was right around the time that Kickstarter was very popular, and we uh, we got a, a nice little bunch of change to do it uh, there, and uh, we made that game, and uh, we've made a, another game uh, called The Order of the Thorn, and we're in the process of working on a prequel to Quest for Infamy now as well, as well as the second Order of the Thorn game. So, you know, we're we're, we're still going. So this was uh, after the the uh, VGA remake of Space Quest 1, the sort of official one that oh, came yeah, out, yeah. eh? Sierra did that on their own in uh, 1991 or 2, I believe. And, uh, yeah, and um, because those weren't much of a success for Sierra, the remakes, they did a they did a remake of um, King's Quest 1, uh, Space Quest um, 1, Leisure Suit Larry, and Quest for Glory 1. And... Um, I guess they didn't sell as well as they'd hoped, so they, they kind of abandoned plans to do VGA remakes of the later games in the series. So that's where fans, you know, took it up. That's where, um, you know, uh, Tierra, uh, AGDI, did a VGA remake of King's Quest Two, and then later on they did a VGA remake of Quest for Glory Two, and um, they they themselves did a, a remake, a VGA remake of King's Quest Three, many years after ours came out. So. <laughs> You know, um, so yeah, there was um, so there was the original, yeah, the official. That's why we made uh, we made the Space Quest Two VGA because Sierra had never done it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, to to you know to make no bones about it, Space Quest Two not considered to be the strongest of the Space Quest games. I'll, oh. I'll level with you with that. Oh yeah, uh, no, I mean, generally, as a, fan, as a fan, I know that. I mean, and. As a fan, my my actual favorite game is probably Space Quest Three. That's but, that's um, the one that I started with, actually. I right. I love that one. Man, I spent I spent a whole summer mowing lawns to be able to afford to buy that game. I remember that very specifically. Nice. Love Space Quest Three, and um, actually, there's a there's a story about that in Space Quest Two later. I'll tell you, but um, uh, yeah. Well, we did Space Quest Two because it hadn't been done yet by Sierra. And because it was considered one of the weakest entries in the series, and uh, we thought that maybe because of that we could have a little fun with with that, you know, and play play with it well. Yeah. So, which I think we did. So, and so do you like at the end of uh, of course at the end of 
Space Quest 2, now that I've finished it, you guys did do like a little teaser for uh, the like Space Quest 3 remake is coming, which yeah, well, that's obviously you got busy with things that are actually you know making yeah. or you know actually your own projects like said, but when we started doing when we started doing these games i was um you know uh most of us were either students or you know like, like me i was you know disabled and, and not doing anything and um you know as life has progressed you know we have kids and jobs and, <laughs> and and all the all the other great stuff that comes along with being an adult but um there was our original plan in space quest 2 was that if you scored a perfect score in the game, you would get to play a bonus Easter egg of the whole complete first level of Space Quest Three inside the garbage freighter. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, and we had that all done, almost. I would say it was about 90% done. And um, we had all the, the backgrounds and everything and most of the animations and uh, a lot of the stuff. It just wasn't fully programmed and it wasn't fully voiced. And everything like that. And um, we kind of had to cancel that Easter egg because we just ran out of time and resources to do it. So, yeah, uh, you know, over here on the old hard drive, we have uh, we have an almost complete first level of uh, Space Quest uh, uh, 3. And we talked about doing a remake of Space Quest 3, but, um, you know, the reality was is that not everybody had the time to devote to a project that we couldn't sell you know, or, or make any money on, and, you know, and we all had bills to pay now, you know, and, right, yeah, and, uh, and, you know, it, it gets to be that way, you know, I mean, if we were, if I was independently wealthy, you know, I would, <laughs> in a second, I'd pay for it out of my own pocket and be like, ah, here you go, world, this is it, but, uh, you know, I gotta pay an electric bill if I want heat in this place, so, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we did have some plans, and it would have been fun. We had design sketches made up for some other areas of the game, like the um, uh, the planet Ortega in Space Quest Three. you know, the one that's all made of lava. Right, and, yeah. You, know, you have to drop the thermal grenade in, the, in, in there. We had this one artist come up with some really great concept art for it and kind of a new a new way to approach it and um, where, you know, it would have, it would have uh, you know, paid homage to the original but as well it would have been a little a little bit of a new take on it and i'm there's always a part of me that wishes we could go back and and do that and and finish up a space quest 3 remake and you know who knows you know we could someday but i don't even know if there'd be anybody interested in it by the time we got to it you know i'd, I'd have to have one of our um, i'd have to have one of our commercial games be like a a runaway success you know <laughs> and, and uh, then then we could devote some more time to that but uh, you know that's the thing with this kind of stuff you know ultimately we did it for fun we did it when we were young and we had time and uh, you know ultimately you run out of that yeah have you had like i know uh it just because it's relevant to my interests as well um i know especially with king's quest stuff there have, you know, you, as you said, there have been a lot of uh, various fan projects around King's Quest stuff that, um, and, you know, a lot of them have been, uh, had the sort of Sword of Damocles dropped on them by uh, copyright stuff. Has that ever, was that ever an issue with you guys? Like, did, C or was, at the time when you were making it, was Sierra so completely <laughs> sort of <laughs> disorganized and, and not, they sort of they seemed it seemed like they kind of went away yeah. for a long time. It was owned by Vivendi at the time when we made these, and our contact Vivendi just said, "Don't sell it. That's it." They were they, there wasn't uh, there wasn't as much drama as um, either other groups had to deal with or or uh, whatever. We never experienced any of that. Uh, we just had uh, we just had a guy say, "Just guys say, yeah, you know, don't don't sell it," and uh, you know, ultimately it didn't matter because. <laughs> You know, Vivendi sold off their interest in it to Activision, and then Activision has uh, gone off and made their own King's Quest game now. And um, and uh, who knows what they're planning to do with the uh, with the Sierra IP? I think they were trying to revive it at one point, but I don't think it was as successful as they'd wanted to. So I don't know about the future of that. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, for us, you know, we're. We're old school fans, you know, of the games we grew up with, and I think we always will be. And it turns out that there's actually a lot of us out there that are like that, that grew up with these games and have an affection for them. And uh, I've made a lot of friends all across the globe simply because of that. And so that's 
been a tremendous part of the experience. You know, a lot of people would say, geez, why, you know, why, why did you put so much effort into something that you couldn't sell? And, you know, part of it's being young and naive and just wanting to do something awesome. But, you know, being, mm-hmm. being, let's see, what is it, 2016 now? You know, being 14 years away from when I initially started this, you know, 14 years older, I can definitely say that the uh, the experience enriched my world. It connected me to corners of the globe that I never would have before. I worked with people from all over, you know, on this, from, you know, Australia to, to you know, uh, to all over Europe, Russia, uh, South Africa, uh, you know, everywhere on the globe, you know, people I've worked with and we've had fans and, you know, that's something that, you know, 15 years ago, I never could have, you know, I, I could have never believed it would be true if you told me someday that I would work on something that uh, would go around the globe and make people happy around the globe, then I'd say you're crazy. So that's, pretty- <laughs> <laughs> that's super cool. Yeah. Really- so, I mean, okay. So, so going back to, to the actual game itself. Uh, so there, there are a lot of things that are different in, in Space Quest 2 than or in, in the, the remake from the original yeah. Um, and I mean, I haven't actually played the original. I, I, I actually did a, uh, you know, I played through space. I, I've been sort of playing through the whole series and yeah. or I'm working I, on I, that. And I played through the first one and I did a poll with my viewers being like, should I play the original Space Quest 2 or should uh-huh. for the authenticity or should I play the remake for the actually, you know, goodness of game. (laughs) And uh, by far, everyone said I should be playing the remake because apparently, yeah, apparently the, the, and, and I know (laughs) like, so I haven't played the original, but I can tell even just by playing the remake uh, that there are definitely, you know, there are things that I kind (laughs) of get the impression that there were definite, you know, changes made um, (laughs) to, to either, uh, you know, make things more clear, or just make it more fun, or or change ideas. And I guess where was that? Uh, what what were your? I guess what what were your favorite changes, or or what what was well, that what, line between the change? You know, what to change and what to keep. Right now, well, like first of all, uh, actually, that's really like a high praise and honor that people were overwhelmingly <laughs> like, play the remake. Like, wow. <laughs> you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I sit in my living room a little isolated sometimes. So, you know, sometimes you never know what people think of your work. So that's uh, that's pretty nice. But um, uh, as far as changes, the big change, I think, that a lot of people talk about is what um, in the original game was the Vine Monster Maze. Um, that's where in the in the the forest of Labion you have the big yeah, yeah. pulsing vine monster, right? In the original version, the vines lay out in kind of like a grid on the ground, and using the arrow keys very gingerly, like you have to press a one at a time, you have to navigate through it. And Sierra was famous for these in their AGI games because you were controlling with a keyboard, and you'd have to go like you know one place, and you couldn't step like if. In other games, it was like, don't step off the edge of a cliff. And this one, it was, don't touch the uh, tentacle or it'll come out and get you. And we thought, okay, that works for, you know, a game where you're controlling it solely with the arrow keys. But for a point and click, you could just be like, uh, click, 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 and especially with pathfinding. So we're like, right. we're going to we're gonna have to rethink this. So I, I came up with the idea... I said, well, you know, like uh, the ship crashes, we could pay homage to Space Quest 4 by putting an unstable ordinance, which was this device from Space Quest 4, in the in the crash ship there. Fans of the series would be like, oh, haha, that's from Space Quest 4. How fun. And then somehow we get that in the uh, – in, into the uh, – into the – somehow we get that into the plant. And uh, my partner Sean goes, oh, yeah, that's great. He goes, he goes well, how are we going to get it into the plant? And I'm like, ah, geez, I don't know. And so Sean, being the clever and twisted one, <laughs> he, goes, he, goes, he goes, why don't we set up a trap where a little furry alien uh, falls into it and you have to take the dead body and you have to stuff it up its butt because the thing will only eat organic matter. And we're like, Okay, so <laughs> I mean that it makes sense, but you know, so like, but then we're like, that's perfectly twisted Space Quest humor. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, like stuffing it, stuffing it, up, stuffing it up a dead alien's butt. So we had a 
we had a bunny, a sprite of a hopping bunny around, so we edited that to make it green, and then we put a pit of the pit of spikes there that was already in the game that you could that you could make as a death. We made it so that um, the bunny would hop out, um, and then fall in there, and you could reach in and get it. And of course, we used that as an opportunity to make it make a joke about how long your arms are, you know, with adventure game logic and right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and so we had a good time with that. So the solution we changed the the puzzle was is that you had to stuff the unstable ordinance up the thing's butt and then put it on the plant's vine and then it would explode and you could go through it. And um, we had a great time with that because uh, the guy that animated the the plant there, his name was a guy named Rich Eater. Well, that was his nickname. Everybody called him Rich Eater. And um, and. Uh, he did the animation for that, and when we when we first saw the animations he did for it, like of it eating the thing, pulsating, exploding, and blowing up. Yeah, this guy he did he did some real quality animation. That guy was a a first class uh, first class animator. So we were lucky to to work with him. So that was probably the biggest change um, <laughs> there. Then besides the asteroid, now in the original game. The asteroid sequence is just a series of long tube-like hallways, like three or four of them for each level, and all they are is long tubes, right? Right. Okay. And, which is fine, you know. In the original AGI game, it, you know they they only had so much memory to work with, probably, probably, you know, and so much you know space on discs, so it was easy to do a large repeating background and. Uh, and, uh, like, in there, you know, you had to find a janitor's closet to, to find something. You had to avoid a, uh, uh, a kissing alien, and you had to avoid a, um, you know, you had to avoid another uh, another obstacle. So we took all of those, and we made actual levels for them. So you had to do the same things. Like, you had to avoid the, the kissing alien, and you had to <laughs> avoid the... The, you had to, you know, you had to get the things in the janitor's closet from there. Um, but we also put other references to Space Quest games in there, including adding a monolith burger, which, as you know, is from Space Quest three and right, four. Yeah. And uh, and so we put because it's monolith burger, so we had a good time with that. We put that in there, and uh, monolith burger probably has most of the Easter eggs in the games because if you go in uh, in and out. The cashier is a different version of Marvin the Paranoid Android each time. One oh, time, nice. it's from the, yeah, it's one time it's from the TV series, and another time he's from the movie. Um, if you hang around inside uh, the Monolith Burger, like it plays Monolith Burger Radio, which was all this crazy elevator music and fake commercials that I recorded all day long with some friends of mine. We, I remember I did one. It was like. Go eat at Mondo Burger. <laughs> just, like, just like doing crazy voices the whole time, and um, that was another thing that was fun. I actually, I actually voiced uh, the villain in the game, uh, Sludge Vohal, um, because I had a cold at the time, and my voice got really deep and gravelly, and it sounded really cool. So we recorded, and I was like. I'll get you, Wilco. You know, that's, it, it almost sounded like Doctor Claw from uh from Inspector Gadget for after a while. I'll get you, Gadget. So, so, you, uh, so you recorded all of his lines during yeah, that one section yeah, while one, you were had a cold. One day while I had a cold. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's kind of funny to listen to. And then, God, I think I have a, I think I have a hard drive full of outtakes from that too, where I'm uh, I'm cursing and swearing up a storm and saying some some really savage stuff <laughs> because I was having a bad time. But. Um, yeah, so we so those are the two biggest changes, probably the vine monster, and the um, and the asteroid levels. Everything else is 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 pretty pretty set to the game. It's the uh, that sort of uh, that you. I felt like the, those definitely captured the the sort of Sierra traditional kind of uh, trolling the the player. You know, like yeah. I. I don't know if you saw in, in my playthrough, I did very carefully click around, walk through that whole maze of yes. the, the vine maze, oh, and, no, then I got, that, and, and then got like, hit like, by the just, thing. Yeah, you like <laughs> sped it up at one point. Oh my god, yeah, we kept... Oh, let me tell you about that, that maze. Oh, We kept the integrity of that. We tried to, you know, as, as much as we could, and programming it was a pain in the butt. We couldn't get it to work for the longest time. We took we took away things. We added things. We added more directions and signposts on where to go than the original had. Like we uh 
we we tried to make it so like there was clues to where you could where you could go and what you could do and everything. But still, yeah, I know. I remember I watched you in the video, just like searching everywhere. Just like, <laughs> there's some part of it you you sped it up for a while because you're just watching yeah. It. Because I was just like, well, well, I mean, it was one of those things where it's like, you know, you you find the right, you find the right thing to do, yep, real early on, but you don't realize it. You know, I didn't realize that I had to like use the thing as opposed to walk to the thing. So I, you know, go off and do a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, you know, I mean, and it's so funny. And then I I look at when you play like when you play the game this time, I'm looking at all these things that are going on. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, geez, you know, if I ever did an update, I would, I would change that. I would I would add a little. Yeah, I'd add a little thing here. We could program that a little better. You, you always do that with your work. You're always like, oh, I could I could do that a little better here. You know, we could do that a little better there. And, and uh, you know, it was a great debate. We almost took the whole thing out. But we're like, if we don't put this in here, original fans of the game are going to roast us. And um, we even considered uh, putting in a, like a little, do you want to skip this sequence thing there? And then we're <laughs> like. Uh, we didn't end up doing that either, you know, but we talked about it. And so it, it eventually – we left it as it was. I mean, you did fix the from. Uh, I was reading a thing that was talking about the, you did fix the 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 most important part of that, which was uh, apparently it was it was almost impossible for people to actually even start that maze because you had to figure out that you put the thing in your mouth. <laughs> It's yeah, like yeah, that's right. Put put gem in mouth. That's a classic Sierra puzzle line as a matter of fact <laughs> i just had a t-shirt made up that that says that that, I, that i'm gonna wear at one of these cons i go to so it's it's famous yeah the, the line was you typed in the parser literally was put gem in mouth <laughs> and yeah so we we made sure that you did that so <laughs> the uh yeah i i i love the you know i i always remember in uh in space quest one there's the uh, there's the there's just like a part when you land on the planet where there's like a little hole in the wall, uh, and it says like there's a hole in the wall. I wonder what's inside. Right, and then you, you go in, you go and look inside and you die. Yeah, it, <laughs> like you know that I know that like that probably you know pisses off the modern gamer, but like I loved that stuff when I first <laughs> played it. Like I first played Space Quest on my cousin's Apple Two GS. Right. You know and. Um, I discovered it over at their house on a disc and I was like, what is this? Oh, wow. This is so cool. We explored every inch of it. And, you know, we, we followed the mantra of save early and save often. So we saved everywhere and, you know, we looked at everything. I got blown up by the spider droid 80 billion times. I looked in that, <laughs> I looked in that hole twice cause I'm a moron. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, there's, there's definitely, you know, some unfair things about some early Sierra games that you can try to correct. But then, you know, sometimes you miss some of the fun, you know, some of the fun in the Sierra games was the deaths and dying. I oh, mean, like, certainly, that's, yeah. That's the way we took the – like, when when you died in our Space Quest 2, we tried to have some fun with those deaths. Like, oh, man, probably the most gruesome death was where the, the predator-like creature grabs you. Oh, man. <laughs> you want to spit and roast you. <laughs> that was – the first oh. time I saw that one, I was just like, holy crap. <laughs> I, you, you think that right well the same guy that animated the uh the the plant blowing up right rich he did that one too and he goes oh you guys you gotta check this out look what i did all right so we we had no clue we didn't tell him to do this he just did it on his own and said here i made this animation tell me if you like it so <laughs> he sends it our way and i'm watching it and i'm like oh and then i was like that is so gruesome we have to put that in there. It's too good not to. So yeah, it was uh, it was funny. It was funny for us too. Yeah, we were like, yeah. "What is this?" Well, and I, I like uh, you know, I with the monolith burger thing. You know, you get the burger. Yeah. And then there's a huge, you know, it's like, oh, I can't eat it here. And then you go, okay, where can I eat the burger? And you spend a bunch of time trying to figure. It's like, okay, well, I'll go sit here, sit down. The laborious process of getting to eat this burger it's like okay i got to eat the burger well i don't know why but i want to eat this burger and you eat the burger and then of course <laughs> it kills you because <laughs> why not yeah yep you know those are those are sierra games we uh you know we try to we try to run the balance uh on that with our own original games too but there was a certain charm to that it's going to make some people mad and others are going to have fun with the charm of it you know i mean i think that uh you know i mean Gaming was just a different thing back in back, you know, twenty almost thirty years ago now. So, you know, but 
we still have fun with it. There's still ways to have fun with it. Like, I mean, I love that you're playing. Uh, we did our remake. Uh, we released it five years ago this year. It'll be five years in December. So, I mean, and you're still playing it. And people yeah. out there evidently still like it. So we're very fortunate. So, I mean, you're when you're going through the doing the remake, um, obviously, I'm assuming that you're, you're spending a lot of time looking at the original one oh, and, you know, going yeah. through every side. And uh, I, I was curious to know whether, like, you found, you, you found, like, like, aspects of the original one that were sort of, like, w decisions that the original Sierra team made in the one they, they, that were sort of... Uh, uh, that I guess were were interesting or, or sort of made made for uh, a different a different game or what what I guess what you sort of learned about their design process yeah in, well, by by know, analyzing it so so intently you know we not only played the original a lot but um, we used software um, called uh, AGI Studio to look at the game's resources and stuff in there and there are some things inside the. Uh, inside the original game resources that got cut out and changed and there's little Easter eggs and um, uh, there's <laughs> in one version of Space Quest 2, I'm not sure how many versions of it had it in there. There was a, a dead body uh, joke that you could type in that was kind of, it was kind of dirty. You could type a, uh, you could type something like screw dead body and it would say, you'd say you're one twisted mofo. The only other person I know that would try that is Mark Crow. Who, of course, is the guy that the other one of the guy that did the graphics for the game, Scott Murphy, <laughs> the writer. So, Scott Murphy was a pretty funny guy. So, I mean, yeah, we uh, we definitely had insight into, you know, how they did things and how they had to do things. Like a lot of a lot of the you know those games, you don't realize it, but uh, they were made because they had to be made that way because they had space limitations, you know, on the right, discs yeah. and uh, etc. Et like that. Like when I was talking about the asteroid earlier, you know, the reason it probably wasn't bigger and more detailed was probably simply space reasons. And, uh, you know, when you were, we're working with pretty much limitless resources now when we make these games and, uh, and it's interesting. They were so creative about how they could squeeze so many things into a certain amount of space. Sometimes I think that kind of creativity in the design process is lost because we're working with limitless resources. I mean, that's where you get feature creep in some of these, you know, AAA titles. Now, you know, what what you know, this was a AAA title in a video game 30 years ago. These programs had to be clever and figure out how to do things. And now, you know, you know, you get these big games where they have, you know, $30 million budgets just for backgrounds. They'd be like, oh, how do we fit this year? I don't know. Hire another 30 people to figure it out. You know, and they'll do that where, you know, they, they didn't have this back then. So I think that economy of programming, the economy of design, and the challenge of design, making a game fun within constraints and boundaries, I think that that's, that is definitely interesting. And that definitely still influences us because – we make games, um, you know, that have compared to what you know we have today. We make within certain boundaries and certain limits, and that uh, that allows us to try to be more creative with how we create things because we're working in limited resolutions, you know, with uh, limited amounts of certain things we can do. So sometimes I think that uh, I think that the the loss of boundaries can be a detriment, you know. So I definitely yeah. think. You, I'm I mean, sorry. yeah. Well, I mean, that is certainly the the uh, having having those limitations can definitely uh, enhance the creativity in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think they did for for uh, teams like Sierra and, and Lucas Arts too. I mean, God, Ron Gilbert back mm -hmm. in the day, that guy just you know monster. You know, as far as a programmer coming up with creative and interesting things, I. I, I've met Ron Gilbert several times in real life, and I've never met anybody. You know, you, you just look at him, and you, you know this guy. He's he's so smart, and he's so funny too. Though, like, he's just got this dry sense of humor, you know, and that comes out in the games and in the writing. And you know, I don't know. I just, yeah, you know, I've I'm pretty jaded, but even I was like a little. I was talking to him about Thimbleweed Park at PAX East earlier this year, and even I'm fanboying out a little. I'm like, oh my god, your game engine's so cool, and the game's so funny, and it's so evocative. How do you do this? Ah! I'm like, what are you doing, Steve? <laughs> you know, you're like, yep. So, but you know, I guess you can be almost forty and still be a big geek. So, I like it. Nice. Uh, I got, I got to ask about uh, Troll Tale. 
in oh my the gosh thing. so You're right i forgot about that is that yours or is that like is that something you guys put in or is that in the original no, that is that is not in the original. That is a total Easter egg on our level, and that is totally the brainchild of um, the main programmer of the game, my partner, Sean Mills. Sean, um, I I had made the room that had the arcade game in it, and and he goes, "Wouldn't it be funny if we tossed a really, 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 really old Sierra game in the arcade machine?" And he's like, "And we do a remake. Um, we do a remake inside of a remake. Nobody's ever done that before." So. <laughs> He picked the old Al Lowe game, Troll's Tale, and he remade it. Got a couple of the art guys to do some art for it. And, you know, like, you don't have to play it. No. And, uh, it's totally like uh, it's totally like in uh, Day of the Tentacle, where you can find Maniac Mansion, the original, yes. in the game and play it. And then do that. And it has no bearing on the original game. You just get to play it. And that's exactly what Troll's Tale did. So. Man, I, like, again, in... Uh... I, the the when I was playing through, I spent like twenty minutes playing Trolls Tale right. and just being like, "What the hell is going on in this game?" Like, I go from one room and then the next room is like completely different, and, and sometimes go back and it's and different. Yeah, the rooms don't connect properly, and like I go from a cave and then I go to the next room and it's like a tiled kitchen and then i go to the next room and it's this crazy like sphere thing and i'm like what the hell is happening that's what the original <laughs> is like man it's like an old apple II game you know like um the lo wrote and god i grew up playing the apple uh, games on the apple II like crazy because there was always one in the back of my classrooms like you know when i was uh, in grade school uh it was the 80s so uh, pretty much every every classroom i was in had an apple II plus in it and uh, I learned how to program in BASIC on those. I learned how to draw and program using a language called Logo. Oh, yeah, and yeah. My, my school had a subscription to a thing called Microzine. And um, Microzine was like, uh, you know, it was like a monthly magazine on disc. And it was the first of its kind. And it had like four or five games on it that you could play it. Like one of them was like a text adventure one of them was like a graphic adventure like that. And um, there were games like Trolls Tale all over those things. And like they just made no sense. Like you'd be like, go north. And like you said, you'd be like, you're in a cave. And then all of a sudden you're standing in like a spherical castle. You're like, I, I just went north. How did that happen? <laughs> so it, there's, there's a certain it, – it's so – it's fun, right? Like because you have to think – like it's almost surreal. Oh, yeah. Um, and – um. I, I I appreciate that though. Like I feel like there was um there was more of like a, a, a sense of innocent surrealism in uh 80s computer gaming and programming simply because there were so many limitations and so many weird things that could happen. It's uh it's also great to have it in the you know in the Space Quest game because it's like, you know, a good illustration of like it's like this is what it used to be. Yeah. If you have any complaints about this game, it could be way worse. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, I got to give all the credit on that one there to Sean. That was uh, totally his. Uh, totally his gig. So nice. So uh, yeah. So uh, obviously making the uh, uh, space the the Space Quest Two remake and doing all the uh, work on looking at the original Space Quest Two. I guess that's the transition from. Uh, infamous quest to an infamous it, adventures, I guess. It, yeah, infamous adventures was uh, the remake group, and infamous quests was the uh, group making original games. What we do oh, okay, now, yeah. And um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, like not everybody who was involved with infamous adventures works with infamous quests, but the core has always been um, myself, uh, Sean Mills, my partner, and um, and uh, our uh, our other partner, uh, James Broom. So uh, Sean is from Australia. James is from the United Kingdom, and I'm from the United States here. So the three of us have always been involved, and a lot of our artists have, have been involved, and musicians, and and so um, yeah, we decided to you know we wanted to make games of our own, and uh, so we did. And and was it was it a deliberate decision to sort of work in the, um. I guess, work in the style of the Sierra games? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we did, uh, we worked, we worked, you know, with what we knew and what we liked. And, I mean, we did try to bring aspects of uh, 
other you know, other kinds of adventure games because you know like we didn't you know I mean I didn't just solely play Sierra games although like they were my first and uh, my early favorites but I mean I played a lot of LucasArts games Loom is a right. favorite of mine oh nice and, yeah yeah. Uh, I, yeah I actually did a playthrough of that uh, uh, a while ago probably a year and a half ago or so right a, I still I still think it's a Loom, great one yeah it's a living work of art I love that game and. Um, uh, you know, of course, Sam and Max Hit the Road is another mm. one of – the humor in that game – I can play that game constantly because the humor in that game appeals to me uh, so uh, so much. And then, uh, you know, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis is great. Day of the Tentacle <laughs> was amazing. Uh, you know, The Dig, uh, all those LucasArts games. And then, like, uh, games like The Legend of Kyrandia. Uh, you know, they were great. Uh, Be Beneath a Steel Sky and uh, – Let's see, what else did I play in my earlier days? We had uh, that and Broken Sword. Oh, geez, yeah, of course. So I mean, there there was a lot of these, um, a lot of a lot of early adventure games. We tried to combine what we loved about all of them into our games, you know, and stuff. But yeah, our games definitely have more of a Sierra flavor. I think that's just, I think that's just because of who we are and what we do. Hey, what do you think of the? Uh, have you played the the? Day of the Tentacle, the remake, the sort of remastered one that just you just know, came I out. Not, I have not played the remastered one. I just I haven't gotten around to. It. I mean, I still play my. I still have my original Day of the Tentacle. Uh, I, I have the original CD and everything. I and so I mean, I I ripped that onto a, a, a hard drive of mine years ago. So I still play that with Scum VM. <laughs> so so like Day of the Tentacle never left me. So I and and I'm. Uh, you know, an old curmudgeon. So HD graphics really don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I guess I don't really care. Like, I mean, a game like that, I can play in the original resolution and be just as happy, you know, like I don't need everything to be HD. And mm. uh, so, so I, I just haven't, I haven't played it yet. I just haven't gotten yeah. around to it, but I've, I've played broken age, uh, uh, Tim Schafer's, uh, Tim Schafer's other latest game that was made uh, with a, uh, with a, uh, Kickstarter. That's what I was looking for. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know. So, but uh, yeah. No. And I hear they're uh, they're here. They're doing the remake of uh, a Full Throttle, which I love too. That and, that's uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Full Throttle. Well, you know what I what I like about these remasters, right? Like these remasters, they're they're not for guys like me. Like right. Like, like I said, like I I still have my CDs and uh, and and stuff of Full Throttle and Day of the Tentacle on my computer, and I use Scum VM, but there are kids today that don't know about that. And these remasters of like day of the tentacle and full throttle, they're opening the door to those kids, you know, to let them experience that. And it's a different kind of game than they're used to. You know, the pace is different. It's slower. The gaming rewards are different, but I'm, I'm starting to find out that like there are kids that come up to me that were born after I played these games you know, who are like, oh, I, I, I played Quest for Infamy and, and I loved it, man. It was awesome. And I was like, cool, man. When were you born? He's like, 1994. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. I was driving a car then. So, so you know, and it's it's really cool. <laughs> but it does, it does, it does make you happy that, uh, that uh, younger people are still able to connect to something that you still hold dear in your heart. Yeah, that it's not just a nostalgia thing. It is a real. Uh, it's a something that people are still interested in. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And um, oh, I remember they did they did uh, they did the remix of uh, Secret of Monkey Island a few years ago. How could I not mention Monkey Island? I love Monkey Island. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I did play the, I did play that. I did get those, and um, um, I didn't like the first remake of that as much as I liked the second remake. Uh, I think the first remake, and I think a lot of people agreed with me, <laughs> they did the hair really weird on Guybrush. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you, ever, you ever looked that up on the internet? Like, people, like, were going nuts over it. So they fixed that for the second remake, and it's nice. But again, more people got exposed to it, and I think that's what's important. It's, uh, I mean, I guess, uh, speaking of uh, of sort of, not remakes, but uh, as sort of new adventure games, uh, and especially, you know, Sam and Max and stuff. Do you have any opinion on like the the Telltale games? That's you know, sort of like, a slightly different style, but right. Well, you know, Telltale's earlier games were more the adventure game kind of style that uh, that that I liked, and a lot of other people liked. And then their their games kind of moved more into 
interactive movies and I kind of lost interest in it, you know, and, um, it really works for them now. It really sells and it's really popular to people. And, you know, that's good. You know, I mean, as a company, you gotta, you gotta make products that people are going to want to play and buy. But, um, I don't really, I don't really care for them. Like, um, I played a little bit of the walking dead and, uh, game of thrones and fables uh, or fable and, uh, and, uh, what was, is it a fable? What is that called? What am I thinking? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I'm not sure. What is it called? Oh well, um, not sure. I play. I played. I played a little bit of theirs, but they. They just. They just. They're. They're not for me. Mm. So. Fair so, enough. But they're. They're definitely well made, and I. I have some friends that have worked at Telltale and, and done stuff with them. So I mean, you know. You know, they just. Uh, they definitely found their niche, and uh, and, they're doing well within that. So that's good for them. Nice. Well, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to take a whole ton of your time here, but uh, uh, what about, um, I guess, what what are you guys uh, working on right now? Oh, like, um, yeah, so we're, um, right now we're actually working on a special edition of Quest for Infamy, which um, not only has, you know, the typical bug fixes and stuff like that, but we have some, uh, we have some uh, things that we've changed and edited and uh, we're uh, making it uh, available on mobile ports. We're going to have uh, mobile ports. Oh, wow, for... nice. And uh, and so that's uh, coming up. And we also have a prequel to Quest for Infamy that we made. Uh, it's called Rome to Ruin, and uh, that will be coming out soon. And then a second chapter in the Order of the Thorn series, which is called Fortress of Fire. Wow. We actually um, – we had, we had a little fun a um, couple months ago where um, a couple guys from the team and I – uh, we programmed a little tribute to Stranger Things. Have you seen that yet? Oh yeah, it's great. Yeah, we made a little adventure game uh, uh, based on Stranger Things that we released for free. Got a lot of, got actually got a lot of press. As a matter of fact, we were I was interviewed by a dude from Playboy last month. <laughs> nice. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I, just, I had to tell my mom. I said, "Mom, I'm in Playboy this month, but I didn't have to debase myself." <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Um, so yeah, that was fun. And uh, the guy who played uh, the lead in that, uh, his name's David Harbor. He's an adventure game fan, and he actually started. Um, we I started following him, and uh, and everything before it became before he became famous and like popular. It was funny. Like his Twitter account only had a few thousand followers when we started following each other, and now I think he's like close to a hundred thousand followers. I love it. The guy's career is blowing up, and he's he's so nice. Let me tell you. Uh, I spoke to him personally a couple times. He's played a couple of our games, and he said he really liked him. He loves adventure games. And uh, when I uh, when I posted the uh, the link to the uh, uh, Stranger Things little tribute adventure game, he reposted that, and it got popular, and we got all the downloads from that. So that was a lot of fun. So. Nice. Uh, I like that. It reminds me of like uh, you know how like Pixar does the little like shorts in front of their movies. Yeah. You know yeah. the idea. Oh, I love those. The idea of 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 doing like a little sort of adventure game short if you will just to kind of keep your hand in as you're doing other stuff i yeah, love that idea that's what it was it was um it was just a one screen game really like you just uh you're just you play as chief opera you get to explore one screen and do some stuff it was just fun it was like a tribute to adventure games and stranger things a lot of people were like oh this is so perfect this should be a full game and and like you know uh i would do a full game if they let us so that would be cool but, uh, right. Netflix, get on that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> give, give us a call. Yeah, yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for talking with me. I know this is, it just was like a thing that it just came, I was like, holy crap, I can actually <laughs> talk to somebody who, who made this thing that I'm playing. And that's so oh, unusual <laughs> that I, I uh, was uh, jumping at the opportunity to do it. So thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you. Are you kidding? I was like, holy crap, somebody's playing this thing I made. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a two-way street here. You know, we're, you're just, it's just enjoyable all over. Um, <laughs> what's I going to say? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really cool. I was really glad to see that you were playing it. And, and you're having a good time, too, like watching you play it and listening to you. I was like, oh, I love hearing this. It's just <laughs> when you hear somebody enjoying something the way that you hoped that they would, the, it makes all the difference because that's all you know, like you make video games because you want people to have fun you want them to enjoy themselves and to watch somebody like you play it and enjoy it you know you know i feel like i feel like that uh, what i've done you know is fulfilling so 
Thank That's you. Awesome. I owe you. I owe you a debt of gratitude. Uh, I, I'm glad that it's not too, you know, uh, I was a little worried that it would be too, uh, you know, be tough to watch. You go like, no, why are you doing? Oh, you're so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's half the fun of watching people play your games. Oh, man, I remember. Um, when uh, when we were first releasing Quest for Infamy, we went out to uh, San Francisco at uh, GDC, Game Developers Conference, to show it. And we had a lot of people playing it, and a lot of um, a lot of journalists from bigger magazines. And this guy from IGN was playing it, and he came back three times to play it, and he was having <laughs> such a great time with it. And he was he's playing, and he's dying, and he's laughing. And he's like, "Oh, I loved games like this. I, I grew up with games like this." And I was like, "This is this is you know this is why we make it." So it's fun when you see people doing things like that. It's awesome. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much. No problem. My pleasure.